Um, so last time, if you remember, where we left off was we're, we're moving these layouts from something that's like really nailed down to something that has a degree of flexibility in it. And we saw that that can be a little problematic because depending on how much flexibility we want, we might get into something goofy like doing the relative positioning. And not that there's anything wrong with that so much. And like the example we had last time was okay. And it's useful in certain situations. It, it, like, it works for you. And it's pretty simple, so no big deal. But if you're talking about a more extensive, larger layout, it starts getting goofy with all the negative amounts. And sometimes I've seen people use negative margins. And, and all that gets to be a little confusing. All right? And to refresh your memory on this, our page looks like this. And again, we're a little off on, little off on, uh, on it doesn't exactly line up. But if you remember, we made this have a little bit of flexibility in that this gets centered. All right. Because some of these things are based on percentages now instead of based on um, absolute sizes. So normally, if we didn't position this guy at all, it would simply appear right underneath this guy. We couldn't give an absolute number because as the margins of the page changes, that absolute number would have to change. So what we did is we set a relative. Uh, position because normally if we had no position at all it would simply place it right here. So we said okay push it over this far push it up this far. And it does the job of course when this expands out of its thing it drops down because again it's still doing the same relative positioning so that's kind of ugly. We could limit that a little bit by putting in a minimum width. All right which we'll, we'll look at here. I could say on this guy, the main nav has a width of 20% and maybe it has a min width of, let's say, 100 pixels. I hope that's big enough to do what I want to do. And now notice that we don't have the problem of it dropping down. So it stays better. All right if you're following what I'm saying. But we're still not, this seems to be, um, as, I, as I alluded to last time, this seems to be sort of the duct tape solution by doing the negative amounts. And again, for a couple things like this, it's not that big of a deal. For a larger, more extensive layout, it seems like, and again, I think people were even observing last time, it seems like a goofy way, a convoluted, tough, however you want to put it, way to do this. Because really, all we want is to put this guy next to that guy. All right? Why should we have to do calculations of negative amounts and all that? We just want to put them side by side. Is that too much to ask? All right? Well, again, with absolute positioning we can do it, but that gives no flexibility whatsoever. This brings us into, in a more flexible situation, the notion of floating. All right. Now, floating is a is a concept that it's one of those that I can I can discuss it and I can give you examples and 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 I can explain it to you. But you really will get a better sense for it once you start playing with it and and going in and experimenting and trying things because um, bits of it are counterintuitive. You know, I'm always it is always interesting. Um, when people first learn this, you know, I've been doing this for so long that it seems obvious to me. But it's one of those things that, yeah, it's obvious if you know it. If you don't know it, then it can appear a little bit confusing. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction of it, just so that we kind of know what we're looking for. And then we're going to go over some examples. But, but best of all, I would expect you to, to play with this and, and to experiment with it uh, on your upcoming labs. All right. Here's a notion of floating. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this page. And 
and I'm going to change it to use my new style sheet. I'm going to make a style sheet 5 that is floating. And I'm going to get rid of the positioning on this. I'm just going to keep what we have so far. Okay, so I have, I'm have i staying the width of the container, the width of the banner, the width of the main nav, and the width of the content. Let me go in and open my HTML code and point to this style sheet. Now, how is this going to look? Well, again, remember back to our basic idea that the way our page looks, the way it's laid out, is a function of the, what the browser naturally wants to do. So the browser defaults and the defaults of the language and what CSS code I put in there to, to tweak that or to change that. So, in this case, all the different elements I'm using, the main ones, are block elements, which means they'll stack on top of each other. So if I do nothing with the position, and I only do the width, which is what my style sheet looks like now, I'm doing nothing with the position of any of these guys, and doing everything with the width, my page is going to look like this. Here's the window. Here's that container div that's going to be 60% of the window. And it's going to get bigger and smaller as I make the window bigger and smaller. The banner is going to take up 100%. Whenever we speak in terms of percent, when we're talking about size, when we're talking about width or height, we have to ask ourselves 100% of what? What is it 100% of? And in this case, it's 100% of that container div. So when we express the width in terms of a percent, it's a percent of whatever element that thing is part of or that thing is contained with. So if we look at the code, the container has a width of 60%, the banner has a width of 100%. That 100% doesn't mean the entire screen width. All right. That 100% mean, um, yeah, that 100% means 100% of its container. So it's not going to go all the way across the screen. It will go all the way across that container div. So if that container div is 60% um, of the screen, then that banner effectively will also be 60% of the screen. It will cover the same area. And we can more or less... Sorry, say, say that again. You just did math and it didn't flow quite the way. Well, I didn't really do math. I, uh, okay, so you said the container div covers 60%. Yes. But if, if you've got something within the container div that's 60% width. Yeah. And it's 60% of the container div. Yes. It's not the full length of the container, so it's 60% of 60%? Well, exactly. Okay. In other words, if I... Yeah. In other words, if I made this banner, the question was, if I made this banner 60%, it would be 60% of the container div. The container div is 60% of the screen. Therefore, it would be 60% of 60% of the screen or 36% of the screen. If the container were 100%, then it would be 60%. Exactly. In this case, the reverse we have. With the container 60%, so that 60% of the screen, the banner is 100% of that 60%. Okay. So it's also 60%. Yes? What is 100% in terms of? It's not. It's 100%. 100%. I mean, but how do we know what those dimensions You don't. The question is, is 100%, how do I know how many pixels there are? And I'm, I'm not being difficult just for the heck of it. I'm being difficult... Um, because it's actually kind of fun to do it once. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm being difficult because that's how it is. 
that's the that's you know the proverbial why we get the big bucks. You don't know what your client has on the other end. All right. So when you're doing things in terms of 100%, uh, on this monitor, the monitor is roughly what 10, 28. This one is or whatever. So it would be a thousand pixels would be 100% if the window is maximized. All right. Now. If the window isn't maximized, then 100% will be however big we made the window. So like, let's, let's look at our page. Oh, we have it up. So right now, that's 100%. That would be 1,000 and change pixels. I don't I forget the exact amount. If we made this like maybe half the size of the screen, then 100% of the screen will be 500 some pixels. If we made this a quarter of the screen, then 100% of the screen will be 250 pixels. If I were to view this on my phone, a, a, a cheap old low-end phone, 100% might be 360 pixels, even if the window is maximized the whole way. So really the challenge of web development is you don't really know what they have on the other end and you want to do your best job to make your page look as good as it can in all these circumstances. That's really one of the big challenges for it. And that's where the fixed layouts start falling apart, right? Because if I make something a thousand pixels, thinking, yeah, a thousand pixels, that's a reasonable size for, uh, you know, for, for a display. Well, yeah, it's a reasonable uh, size for a display, but what if someone has really bad eyes and they have uh, an 800 by 600 monitor? Then there's 200 off the edge of it. Or what if someone is accessing this on their phone and they only have 320 pixels going across? Then they have to scroll three times plus to get to all, all 1,000 pixels. So, again, that's really the challenge and that's one of the things that we're addressing. Um, we address that to a degree in this class. Um, the focus on this class is uh, on desktop, and you know, the desktop environment, but we always have to have an eye on the mobile. Even if we're not necessarily doing tons of work talking about mobile uh, web design, we always want to be like having that in the back of our head. So, again, these percentages relate to the percentage of the, the, the window that is open. It's not even really, I, I think I've been misstating sometimes in saying the 100% the of the screen. It's not really 100% of the screen, it's 100% of the window that is open. And then again, if the window is maximized, then it would be 100% of the screen as well. Did that answer uh, the question? All right, great. So let's go in, let's save this guy. Let's have it point to my new style sheet, which I think I forgot to do, and save. There we go. And these divs line up on top of each other, which is exactly what would expect these I said divs, I meant these elements, because they're not strictly speaking all divs. But they're all, they're like divs, all right? These, these blocks. These blocks all line up on top of each other because I haven't said anything with the positioning of them at all. Now, what I want to do is this. I would like to slide that orange block, the content block, right alongside the navigation. All right? That's, that's ideally. We saw how we could accomplish it last time with relative positioning, but as we said before, that gets to be a little, uh, you know, that gets to be a little hackish, all right, in terms of, um, you know, that's very vulnerable to something changing and having it break, all right. In other words, if we change the size of something, if we make our navigation a little bit bigger, for example, all right, then boom, that, that falls apart. All right. What we really want is that to slide next to it. Isn't there a way to say, put it next to it? Well, the closest thing we have to that is what's called a float. Here's how the float works. I'm going to go and I'm going to create a separate example. All right. 
where all we're going to have is two floating divs. Then we'll come back and incorporate it back into this one. Floating works like this. I can put a div on the page and I can put another div on the page. I can float them to the left. I will float both of these to the left. It will work this way. If there's sufficient space to put them side by side, it will. So, let's say my window is 800 pixels and each of these are 300 pixels. For simplicity here, I'm going to disregard anything like padding and border and margin and all that. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just speak uh, as though the total size of these is 300. So if I float this one left and float this one left, there's enough space for them on the same line. So think of these coming in. When I say float to the left, I'm going to float it as far as I can to the left. I'm going to then float this guy as far as I can to the left alongside the thing to its left. All right. I'm going to put it alongside the thing to its left provided it fits. Alright, so if we have 800 pixels, the total window is, and if this is 300 pixels and this is 300 pixels, then yeah, this will fit alongside this one. So A will be here, B will be immediately to its left. What if I resize the window though, and I resize the window so it's now 600 pixels? Well, what do we got then? Well, we can still fit this guy here, right? We can push it to the left. This guy, though, my drawing will be a little off, isn't going to fit there, right? There's going to be some hanging off the end of the window. So it won't put it alongside of it. It will drop it down beneath. All right? Now, that sounds goofy at first, right? That sounds goofy like, you mean it'll be to the left of it or underneath it? Boy, that sounds dumb. Well, not if you really think about it. Because if you have a big monitor, you'll want maybe a two-column display. Right? Um, you know, you think of reading a newspaper. You know, newspapers, you have two columns in it, right? That helps your eye reading going across. So you'll have two columns in this hypothetical page that I'm, uh, I'm talking about. However, if I'm on a mobile phone, the two columns won't work, right? It'd be too wide. It, you'd have to do a lot of scrolling horizontally. Remember, as a rule, vertical scrolling is, is easier, is better than horizontal scrolling. I mean, if there's too much content for the screen, you've got to scroll one way, right, or, or the other. Um, so as a rule, if you've got to scroll, vertical scrolling is, is, is better than horizontal scrolling. So if I were on a phone, let's say, that was even smaller still, then I've just taken my two-column article and turned it into a one-column article. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you want to do on a mobile phone. Uh, how many of you use, the, the, use your phone to browse the web frequently? All right. Almost all the sites you get are one-column sites. Right? Most of them. They work the navigation in so that's one column. Why? Because multiple column stuff doesn't work on a phone. Doesn't work very well. Isn't very effective. So you go to a big old site like Amazon, it has a bunch of things going on. Columns all over the place if you view the desktop version of it. If you view, view the mobile, mobile version of it, it's just one column going down. Alright? Why? Because that fits nice on a phone. Alright? Now, Obviously, there's more going on in Amazon than just floating, but floating is sort of the first step in that direction to say, hey, we're going to look at how big the screen is and we're going to shift things around. All right? This is where you get into what's a lot of times called liquid layouts. Remember we said the first were kind of frozen. They're ice layouts. The fixed ones, they're like locked into place. If you say it's in that position, it's in that position for eternity. All right? We then talked about jello layouts where 
Yeah, the page wiggled a little bit, all right, as you resized it, the margins moved a little bit, moved in and out. But the overall structure of the page stayed the same, just like a piece of jello. If you flick it, it'll wiggle, but, you know, it's not going to just splatter all over the place, all right. A liquid, though, what shape is a liquid? Well, liquid is whatever shape this container is in. You know, if I have a wide beaker and I pour liquid into it, the liquid will be short and wide. If I have a narrow beaker and I pour liquid in it, it'll be thin and tall. That's sort of what we're getting at with this. With liquid layouts, your content takes, takes the shape, takes the size of the container. So let's go, I'm going to go and build a brand new page here. And for simplicity, I'm going to put the CSS right in the same file. Again, because this is really just a, uh, a, a demo page. This isn't meant to be like uh, a perfect page. And I'm going to put two divs in here. In honor of Dr. Seuss, we'll call them Div 1 and Div 2. And out of laziness, I'll just put the phrase first part of article in this one, second part of article in this one. All right. I'll then go again. I'm not using the external style sheet. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't. You should always use an external style sheet or nearly always. So I'll give both of these to start the same width and floating and so on. Except I'll make them different colors so that we can really easily see which from which. So I'll make the one yellow and the one red. All right. Save this. We go and look at this. All right. There they are. There they are right next to each other. Let me go back and show the code because I didn't have the right screen up. I simply made two divs, div 1 and div 2 and gave each of them the style rule of a width of 300 pixels, float left, and then I gave them two different colors. So if I look at this, this one got shoved as far to the left as it could. This one says, hey, put this guy along the side of its neighbor to the left. All right, with a catch, if it can fit on the same line. All right, so when you say float left, it means put it next to it's neighbor to the left, all right, provided it fits. If it doesn't fit then, what's it going to do? It's going to drop it down. So we can test this. All right, we make it bigger, smaller, and so on. You know, 300 plus 300 is 600, all right. So as long as the window, or yeah, the window stays above 600, it's going to put them side by side. As we get here, the suspense is building, boom, right there, it could no longer fit it alongside of it and it drops it down below. All right.
finally, when you're all when it's all said and done, I mean, it's not going to cut it off. If you had a screen that was, you know, if you had a tiny, tiny, tiny screen that was 200 pixels across, well, there's nothing it can do. It's not going to cut the stuff off, so it will give you the horizontal scrolling. All right. Now we can view this in the mobile emulator to kind of more or less prove our point. You know, typically people on their desktop browser are going to have the browser window open, probably this big or bigger. But someone on a mobile device might very well have a much smaller screen. In which case, that's how it would look there. And again, if you think about it, you know, try to, try to visualize if this was an actual couple paragraph story or something. You know, it would be a nice two column story in the one, on the other one it would be, you know, a, a, a nice one column story. Keep in mind, again, don't let the ugly colors throw you. I'm using the colors just to uh, make it obvious what's going on as far as the divs and what they're doing. You know, typically I'd, I'd do both of these with a background of white if this was like a news article. And then you'd, you'd, you'd see it. And on a wider screen, you'd see two columns side by side. On a narrower screen, you would see two columns on top of each other. Now, getting back to this, these two will run right into each other. All right. What can we do to fix that? Yeah. Well, our three choices are border, margin, and padding. And the correct answer it depends on, on where we want to put the space. All right. If we want to put the space between the edge of our div and the content, that would be padding. If we want to put like some kind of border around it that, that starts at the end of the content, we would do a border. If we wanted to put space between the two divs, we'd use a margin. All right. Let me do, let me do it. Border is pretty obvious. I, you know, I, I, it was even hard for me to say. If you want a border, you'd, you'd use the border, which you know, I think you guys would have known even before this class started probably. All right. But the padding and margin isn't quite so obvious. So let me do an example doing it both ways so you see the difference. I'm going to put a padding of 20 on each of these divs. Now again, I'm going to use a shorthand of simply saying padding 20 pixels. I could say padding top, padding left, padding bottom, padding right. All right? And that would I could control each one of those individually. But I'm going to just say padding 20 pixels, and, and that implies the padding in all four directions. So I'll give both of these divs a padding of 20 pixels. And we go and look at this. Ah. Notice that that extra space, because padding is inside the border, and it's from the edge of the border to the content, that extra space is yellow or red. All right? Um, because the padding is, is part of the content of it. If I were to change this to margin, you'll notice the exact opposite happening. That is, the extra space will be outside of the border. So, notice, boom, goes like that. Now, here's something that's interesting. All right, it fits there. That boy. This, almost, this question almost makes me wish that I had exams in this course, because this would be a great question. All right. Notice with a padding of 30, it fits alongside of each other. I'm sorry, not a padding, a margin. 
with a margin of, of 20 actually. All right, take two. With a margin of 20 pixels, these two things fit alongside of each other. All right. Let's see what happens if I change that to a padding of 20 pixels. Take three. With a padding of 20, they're on top of each other. If I go and change this to a margin of 20, I'm guessing they'll be side by side. And I'm wrong. Never mind. Um, I've lost my mind. What I was getting at with this is the, and it could just be that I'm just a pixel or two off uh, resizing the window. I wanted to illustrate the notion of the of the the, the margin collapse. All right, that if you say there's a margin of 20 between two things, that doesn't mean that there will be a margin of 40. Then that if one of their margins will be enough, then you know it doesn't add the margins together and make sure that it's the maximum of the two margins. All right, but at any rate. That's what I wanted to demonstrate. And you certainly can have both, padding and margin. So that you have a little bit of space there and then you have space in between them. Do keep in mind, though, that with the padding and margin, that adds to the total width of your block. All right. So with zero padding and zero margin, these will be side by side as long as the window is 600 pixels and bigger. Now that I added 10 padding and 20 margin, this is a very tricky question, but it will be, it definitely will fail bigger than 600. You know, it, it will not make it to 600 before it fails. Because actually you'll have 10 padding on the one, 10 padding on the other. You should have this. If we have 20 margin, 10 padding, 300, another 10 padding, another 20 margin. We have the margin collapse, so we don't have 40 margin. We have 20 margin. 10, 300, 10, and then 20 again. 20, 30, 330, 340, 360, 370, 670, 700. So, that one will fail at 700 compared to the other one failing at 600. By failing, I mean not really failing, but, the, but not being able to put it, failing to put the, the things alongside of each other. All right. It's tricky. I just want to introduce the concept to you and sort of introduce the idea of what, what's going on. Now, this is floating with absolute numbers. Right? We could also do stuff like percentages. All right? So, what if I make this, this percent 40%? Or we'll make it 30% for good measure. Oops. No. Oh. I make it 30%. You might say to yourself, well, 30% plus 30%, that will always fit alongside of each other, right? Because that's 60%. You know, 60% will never be bigger than 100%. Yeah, except for a couple of factors. One factor is, is we've added the margin and the padding into the equation. So that's extra space that each one of these takes. So each div doesn't take 
20, uh, it doesn't take 30%, it takes 30% plus whatever margin and padding it has. The second thing is, is it's not going to split content. So like if you get to a real tiny, tiny, tiny screen and you have a long word, it's still going to put that long word in. It's not going to go and split it out. So if we do this, again, there will still be a point at which, boom, that drops down below. Even though we think 30% plus 30% is that. I guess we could be safe for one of these things if we made these guys percentages. So let's make 1%, 1%, 2%, 2%. Okay, so that, yeah, we should be okay with that. In which case, notice that as we make it smaller, the panning gets smaller too. And the margin gets smaller. We can't, actually can't make the window small enough to make that guy go underneath there. So that's real liquidy. All right. Is there a rule of thumb in terms of design where if, you, if you're using percentages, if you sort of stick percentages across the board? No, not necessarily. necessarily? Right. We can further throw a monkey wrench into this by doing things like throwing in, and here's, here's like a, a common exception. Your question made me think of this common exception. I might put like a minimum width on some of these things. So I might say the width is 30%, but I want a minimum width of 200 pixels. Maybe there's a 200 pixel image inside here and I don't want to cut it off. I'm trying to think what would happen if there was a 200 pixel image. But regardless, for whatever reason. Notice again, it won't get any smaller than that. But at a certain point that will drop down because there's not enough space to have that 30% plus padding and margin. Keep in mind at this point, how do I want to say this? At this point, I'm demonstrating the features of the language. I'm talking a little bit about like why you might want to do, use these things, but really my focus is just to demonstrate how it, wor how it works. Your challenge is to take this and apply it to particular problems. In other words, to say, this is what I want my layout to look like, this is how I want it to act, and then figure out what mix of these. You know, these are all tools in, in, your, in your tool chest, all right? There may even be a case where you want something that has a fixed layout, in which case that's another tool that's available. I would guess that most of the CSS Zen Garden uh, style sheets that were developed are with a fixed layout. Simply from the perspective of there's such intricate layouts that if you started floating things around, you know, things would bump into each other, <laughs> all right? And therefore you want to nail it down to have it have a very precise look. So if there's something that, if you're designing a site where the very precise layout that it should look like a magazine brochure, and you know, magazine brochure doesn't get any bigger or smaller, it's that size. If you want that, then maybe the fixed layout's the way to go. I will say that increasingly those kinds of sites are becoming more and more rare simply because uh, of mobiles. Now, we're going to talk a bit about mobile uh, web development um, sometime. I'm not really sure when. I'll have to check the schedule. One thing to keep in mind is, well, a couple things to keep in mind. One thing to keep in mind is very often an organization will have a different mobile site than the desktop site. So some of these 
concerns that I'm talking about for mobile are it might be a little bit moot because they'll go forth and, and create a second site that's optimized sort of for mobile that, that is geared towards that. And we'll talk about the rationale for doing that too. The other thing to keep in mind is because we've been really behaving ourselves in this class, all right, and we've been doing a clean separation of the presentation and content, we can write a page that applies different style sheets depending on whether it's a, a mobile browser accessing it or a desktop browser. All right? And that's pretty cool. We'll, we'll, we'll see an example of that going forward. So we can write one page and have two different style sheets in it and tell the browser, gee, if you're a mobile browser, use this one. If you're a desktop browser, use this one. And that get, that's pretty powerful. All right? Those are all things that will come up when we, we discuss this in more detail. Now, this is our demo example. All right? Are there any questions about it and what I did with it? All right, what I'd like to do now is go and take this and apply it to the template that we were looking at. In other words, yeah, this is all well and good, but really who's ever going to want to design a web page that looks like that? All right. Let's go back to our template example. And I could do something like that. Let me close this guy. I'm going to try something real quick. Tell you what, I'm going to actually turn the camera off so I don't confuse you. Pardon me? What did I do? Oh, the screen still stayed up. But the folks at home, whatever, doesn't matter. All right. I took and I floated the main nav and the content to the left. I briefly lost my mind and couldn't remember if I would need to float main nav or not. I do because floats floats next to the last thing that was floated. So if I float main nav to the left, it will push it all the way to the left. Anything I float after that is going to be floated. Uh, along with that. So the order that you put it in makes a difference? The order that the HTML code is in makes difference with regards to floating. But not on the... Not on the style sheet, no. No. So what I did is I said float left, float left. So, headers up here. This guy is floated to the left. This guy, because there's enough space, will float it alongside of it. As I make the page smaller and smaller, at a certain point it will drop down and maybe on a mobile device it would look like that. To where I have my navigation on the top and then um, I have the content down below. Which again, is pretty typical for a mobile looking site. All right, to have uh, an organization like that. One second. And when we start getting fancier and, and start applying different style sheets, we can do all kinds of wonderful things to the, the styling of those links and so on. Yes? So we're floating left as an example. But you, I'm trying to think of an example for, you know, float top, float right, float bottom. You know, I almost always float to the left. Um, but there are cases where you want to do that. Um, it, it, the, the idea works the same way. Let's go and let's do this. If I were to decide, I think what this will do is just reverse the order of those divs. 
And sure enough, it does. So the first element, it floated as far to the right as it could. The next one, it put alongside of it. So one, one thing. This is a nice feature because what if I developed my site with the navigation on the left, someone comes in and says, eh, I want it on the right. You just switch the floats in the CSS and boom, there you go. Right. Um, what would happen or could you foresee a situation where you float one left and float one right? Yeah. Okay. And, and that would kind of like leave like a, a little like gap in the middle. All right. Let's, let's do this in this case. Let's flow... If you look at that, that kind of looks goofy. I might want that to line up over here. So if I do that, then... I have that, and I have that. Now... Let's, there's one more thing I want to do. Let me get this back to how it was originally. So right now this is, let me put a footer in. Let me make this guy smaller. And let me go my template and add a footer. Trying to make trying to make it fit alongside of that. I know I can do it. I thought I could. I'm having trouble forcing the problem that I want to force. Sometimes when you do this, you'll get something appearing here even though you don't want it there. With all your floating. Well, for example, I guess if I were to say float left on this. Yeah, let's do let's do that. One of my lost my head here. Say float left. There we go. That's what I wanted. So that's floated to the left, but I don't want the footer there. I want the footer underneath. I want to float to the left, but like not based on that guy. So what I can do is I can put in a clear both. I can do a clear left, clear top, or clear both. And Probably right and bottom as well. But what this does is this says, let's wipe the sl uh, str uh, slate clean and let's start floating this guy anew, as though it was the first thing on the page floated. And so what I could do then is I'll get this. 
which is what I wanted. Put in some different minimums for both of these. The whole notion of making a design, uh, a design, making a web pages or a site that sort of conforms itself to the, the browser that's being used or the, the device that's being browsed on or user agent is probably the precise term. It's called responsive design. And that's a bit, and sometimes called adaptive design. There might be a difference between um, adaptive and responsive, but I have a feeling there's not a big difference and I don't care if there is a difference. The, 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 tech, the ideas are the same thing. The ideas are that you make a site so that they're essentially very liquid, all right, that conform itself, that adapts itself to the, um, to the container. And doing things by floating and doing things based on percentages is like the first huge step in doing that, all right. There's a couple other things that we can do too. For example, when we put images in there, we can specify image sizes based on percentages, right? That's pretty cool. So in other words, on a desktop monitor, you know, if we wanted to show a picture on a desktop monitor, you know, we wouldn't want to just show a tiny picture on a desktop monitor just because someone is going to be, someone might be displaying this on a phone, right? So we could specify maybe a percentage of the width of an image. And if you're on a big monitor, you see a big picture. If you're on a little monitor, you see a little picture, all right? Or if you're on a mobile device, you see a little picture. The other thing, the other aspect of responsive uh, development that we'll, we'll touch on is um, where we apply different style sheets dependent on the device. And, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. Again, I can't really recall that. This especially, you know, this is true of, of any topic probably in any class. You know, this, you know, I could watch Tiger Woods golf until, you know, I'm 100 years old and that wouldn't make me a better golfer, all right? Um, by getting out there and doing it is what's going to make you really understand this and make you really be better at this. So the lecture is kind of like taking golf lessons where you watch someone and you pick up some tips and you get sort of the basic idea. But really the learning comes when you go and you start experimenting with it. So I encourage you to experiment with with this on maybe labs that you've done previously, labs that you're working on now, and certainly your project. Um, you know, so, so take things. A, a really good thing to do is to take uh, something, design it one way, then do what you can to make it look as different as possible. All right? I think we have that as an assignment. I'm not sure if we've assigned that one yet. But I think we have that as an assignment where you create Two page, you, you create two versions of the same page just by switching the style sheet. And really, ideally, you know, the, 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 the ones that make me the happiest are the ones where the two pages look nothing alike, all right, from a visual perspective. They have the same content, but they look different. Keep in mind here that when in changing these style sheets, I was only focusing on position. There's so much more I could do to make these each iteration of these look different with the colors, with the fonts, with background images, and so on. So the focus of the last couple of classes was just on a position. So, so, um, but don't think that that's the only thing that you, you can tweak. You can tweak all the other, don't forget all the other stuff that we learned previous to that. All right, questions, yes? Um, you mentioned on uh, Tuesday that we should check our work on different Yes. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. And different browsers, just in case there's a, a quirk in the implementation of it. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's one of those things, how do I want to say? Um, I think I have a good hang of this, you know, in creating CSS and all that. And so I could write CSS code that I'm pretty sure works, 
<laughs> you know, but we want to do better than being pretty sure it works. So, you know, I may think, yeah, I'll do this. Uh, and I may have an idea in my head, yeah, that's what it's supposed to look like. And I might be right most of the time, but I'm surely not going to depend on that, you know, depend on my notion that I think I'm right, you know. I, uh, I just actually made a tuition payment for my daughter out of the wrong bank account. All right. I used my personal account instead of the account that we have for tuition. So checks are bouncing all over the place today. All right. Uh, so what I think isn't necessarily what's actually true. I thought I had the right bank account, and I'm pretty good at making payments, but still I wasn't correct here. So same thing here. Yeah, you, you, you do the floating. You, you may be pretty sure that you got it down and have it right, but you still check it. You know, if for nothing else, to see if there would be possibly a browser issue in here. Really what's tough about CSS is, I have the luxury in this class of picking the things that I want to demonstrate and demonstrating those and making them work. All right? But when you're doing actual web pages, you're doing other stuff along with that. Right? You're putting all, you have other CSS code to accomplish other things and you have images and you have all kinds of stuff on your page. So each individual, how do I want to say this, each individual part of CSS is kind of simple. I would say floating is probably the hardest of all the concepts. But what gets tough is when you start mixing and matching like the, someone said about like ma um, uh, mixing um, absolute pixels with percentages. Yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where some fun starts. Yeah. All right. We'll see you in lab.